uh, Mr. Lampas. Uh, as far as I understand, we have simultaneous interpretation here, so those of you who do not understand Russian, please take your earphones on, because I definitely would like to use the great Russian language within the walls. Let, let me interrupt my friend to say that on his part, this is a question of choice, because his English is impeccable. Thank you. Um, I I uh, distinguished Mr. Lantus, uh, esteemed colleagues, first of all, please allow me on behalf of the Russian delegation and the Committee on International Affairs of the State Duma, express my gratitude to the leadership of the House of Representatives, uh, Madam Speaker uh, Nancy Pelosi, and to the Committee uh, on International Affairs, Mr. Rantis, for organizing our work so well, as well as for this uh, initiative uh, to conduct this uh, meeting. This is meeting number three in this unusual public format, and this definitely will make our discussions um, brighter, more interesting, and I'm sure this will become the practice uh, to meet in the future. And we definitely are ready to support this uh, public format for our meetings, including meetings in Moscow. Our meeting today is indeed of great importance in the general context of U.S.-Russian uh, relations, which, despite certain well-known uh, discussions, uh, serious discussions, are moving forward, nevertheless, in many important areas, uh, which are important not, not only for uh, Americans, but also for Russians. And indeed, we were able to understand one another better on issues of fighting uh, and meeting new challenges, such as international terrorism, uh, drug trafficking, uncontrolled immigration, uh, people trafficking, trafficking people, and we definitely cooperate better in fighting various problems related to uh, WMD proliferation. We, we actually have moved forward in the North Korea, on the uh, issue of North Korea, and we also understand one another better with respect to the Iranian nuclear program. Also, we cooperate in a positive way in solving many acute regional conflicts. Uh, for example, the tragedy of the Palestinian people. Uh, last week, once again, became uh, a critical issue. And we, as co-sponsors of the peace process in the, mid, uh, in the Middle East, uh, have this great responsibility to resolve these new problems. And we hope that uh, the same understanding will be reached on other issues where we haven't yet found consensus, including the situation in Iraq, the situation around Kosovo, and, of course, including the so-called frozen conflicts in the former Soviet Union, including in some uh, places which are on the borders of uh, Russia, such as Abkhazia and North Ossetia, as well as in Transnistria, where a lot of Russian citizens reside. And we cooperate very well in other areas, including space exploration for peaceful purposes. We cooperate on energy issues, including on nuclear energy issues. And we have reasons to believe that very soon, some very important new, uh, new, new events are possible. And we also have done a lot in terms of economic and trade cooperation, and an important factor that demonstrates that we indeed view each other as partners is the fact that the uh, Russian investment in U.S. economy 
is becoming comparable to the U.S. investment in Russian in Russia. And this shows not only mutual trust, it also creates new jobs, it creates new technologies and new solutions for the benefit of our countries and our peoples. Now the potential of par parliamentary democracy in this context has not been exhausted and sometimes hasn't been touched upon. Sometimes we face situations when certain members of parliaments uh, on both sides sometimes uh, have superficial attitudes, uh, anti-American and anti-Russian phobias, which I guess we have inherited from the times of the Cold War. I am convinced that in general it is in our interest uh, to realize that we have many more common uh, issues and areas of cooperation than uh, disputes. And it is our responsibility and our duty before the civil society in our countries to seek mutual understanding through deeper and more objective understanding of one another uh, through mutual initiatives and actions. We in Russia perhaps sometimes are too sensitive to those assessments uh, that we hear from foreigners, from our foreign partners uh, with respect to Russia. Nevertheless, I can't say, uh, I must say that sometimes we're puzzled and quite disappointed by certain statements that we hear from official uh, evaluations of the State Department and in the resolutions of both houses of uh, Congress and also in some statements by our distinguished colleagues. Well, definitely all these people have the right to criticize and have the right to have their own point of view. And we in Russia are on the difficult path of building a sovereign democratic society with a developed market economy and with a free civil society with the spirit of respect for the rule of law and human rights. Not everything is simple on that road. Definitely errors do occur. And we Russian politicians know what the real situation is better than uh, some other people. And we're always grateful for constructive criticism when it's justified. However, in some cases, this criticism is based on uh, unilateral, one-sided uh, sources, subjective sources, and we can't accept such criticism, especially if it becomes some kind of uh, personal uh, characterizations which are unacceptable, especially when they are directed uh, at the head of the Russian government who do not accept this type of criticism under any circumstances. In the reports of the State Department and in the resolutions of Congress, Russia is sometimes uh, characterized as the country which does not coincide with uh, the real situation. And we in Russia irrespective of our uh, party affiliation, do not recognize that Russia that's depicted in those documents. In fact, lately, very often, modern Russia, Putin's Russia, is compared to Yeltsin's Russia of the 1990s. And very often, the conclusion that we hear is that modern Russia is moving backward and is not as... Uh, advanced, not as good as the, as, as the Russia of the 90s. Now, if you ask Russian citizens what Russia they prefer, in what type of Russia they would rather live, I must uh, tell you that the uh, great majority 
of Russian citizens definitely will give the opposite answer. In other words, they like Putin's Russia much better than Yeltsin's Russia. The Russia that we know and love is the Russia where economic development in the course of uh, last six or seven years have been twice as high as economic growth in the United States. A country where real incomes of citizens have grown twofold and where also uh, we have twice, uh, uh, twice fewer people who are below uh, the poverty line. And very often it is said that we get great uh, proceeds from selling oil and gas. But the percentage of these proceeds have been going down. And also this and other areas of our economy are open to foreign investors and two-thirds of all energy sources in Russia uh, is being uh, worked by foreign companies, many of them American. R R Russia, which we like, at, uh, which we know, is a country where the president was open, uh, was uh, elected in free and fair elections, and his approval rating is uh, 70 to 80 percent of those polled, which means that he is still acting in the interests of the majority of the Russian population. Our country is the country where at our parliamentary elections in December, there will be more than 10 various, uh, actually there will be tens of political parties, and where not two, but many more political parties will be represented in the Duma. So every uh, voter will be able to find somebody in the parliament whose views he or she endorses. Russia is a country where the uh, United Russia faction in the Duma has a constitutional majority, but it didn't change the constitution, including the well-known discussion with respect to two presidential terms. Moreover, we have taken advantage of our majority to change the electoral laws in such a way that even if there are more voters that support us than last time, we will not have the same parliamentary constitutional majority as before, and we believe that this new system is much more democratic. Russia, which we know and which we love, is a country that uh, strictly adheres to its international obligations. It's a country that, since its independence, have not withdrawn from a single international treaty. It's a country that has ratified such important, uh, important treaties as the uh, uh, treaty ban, uh, the CFE, uh, and the Kyoto Protocol. Russia is a country which has not only drawn its troops out of Central and then Eastern Europe, but also the majority of countries of the former Soviet Union, and uh, has voluntarily lim decreased its military presence in uh, its own territory, in the Russian and the European side of the Russian Federation, by more than 100,000 uh, troops, which was uh, a sign of uh, increased security in the international arena. Russia has never used its force outside its own territory without especially sanctions from the UN, and Russian peacekeepers in Transnistria, Abkhazia, Southern Ossetia have stopped wars that took place in those territories and have prevented and stopped bloodshed and are not allowing for military activities to restart at this time. The Russia which we know and love is a country where the secret services, FSB, don't have any secret or even non-secret jails because beginning with last year all the 
uh, jails of the FSB with, in accordance with the European standards have been given to the Ministry of Justice and are now completely transparent to the control of civil society. We are trying to prevent a new uh, loop of arms race. We are trying to keep space demilitarized. We hope that the mil regions of the Near East and the Far East, as well as the Korean Peninsula, become denuclearized. Russia is the country where more, for more than 10 years, the death sentence has not been implemented, not only juridically, but in practice. And this also corresponds to the highest European standards. Finally, Russia, which we know and love, is a country which well remembers its own and the international history. We remember how our soldiers, together with our allies, including, of course, the United States, overcame Nazism in the Second World War. And today's relation that we have towards the uh, achievements of those soldiers does not change uh, in uh, any aspect as a result of policy. That is the Russia that we love. And we have come here so that the United States would know and love that country. And we came here in order to bring back home with us new knowledge, a new understanding of the United States, bring it home to Russia so that our country then would better know and love the real America. We are sure that in the U.S.-Russian interparliamentary relations, we uh, can see an important future. Our task is not to try and find better formulation for sharpness of our disagreements, but to find points of commu uh, common points where we could find common causes and common understanding for solutions of uh, issues that stand before us and our countries. We came here with the idea to deepen our interparliamentary cooperation. Our ideas are positive, and I hope that we'll be able to discuss them in a more positive manner in the second half of the day when we will be working in a, in a non-public forum. But I would like to point out some of them already and uh, what we would like to propose to our colleagues is to uh, concentrate their attention at, on three new directions that we'd like to propose. First of all, we'd like to see significant diversification of the cooperation of the two parliaments. Presently, the contacts between the committees on international affairs seem to be almost the only forum for our interparliamentary communication. Unfortunately, that is really not enough. We are convinced that other colleagues, other committees must be drawn into this cooperation in a, to a greater extent, especially those who deal with macroeconomic issues, in industry, agriculture, science, high-tech issues, because our laws and their coordination will have an effect on how cooperation in these, all these areas will move ahead. Secondly, we will propose to our colleague to come to an agreement to start implementing in our everyday work a uh, early warning mechanism, I'd call it, on joint initiatives. We would like to avoid situations in which the United States is being discussed in the Russian parliament without participation of our American partners. And we would like to avoid a situation where the Russian Federation is being discussed in the House of Representatives without the participation of Russian colleagues. And then we find out about the activities of each other through the press outlets and are faced with new surprises. We are in the same boat. And the sooner 
we'll be able to start discussion of issues, including the most important ones. The more we, we, the more we're able to do it, the better the results will be. We have an opportunity to present to our colleagues a practice of undertaking joint missions into hot spots of the of our planet. We all, we often argue about how we see various situations and what solutions must be reached in regards to them. We should agree about joint uh, missions of our committees, of our members, to let's say Kosovo or to Iran or to the Baltic states where human rights of the Russian population cons cons uh, consider consistently are violated. Uh, if that happened, our relations would find uh, a closer more closeness and we'd be able to respond to the wills of our electorates and our peoples. I believe that our work today will be constructive and I'm thankful to our American colleagues and to Mr. Lantos for the key in which uh, he placed our uh, the start of our meetings. I would like to also present the Russian delegation here. Many I think are familiar to you because it was almost the same group that came here before for the previous joint meeting of the two committees. Leonid Slutsky is the first deputy chairman of the Committee on International Affairs. He represents the fraction of the Liberal Democratic Party of the Russian Federation. He is the opposition in our delegation. Natalia Narishnitska, she's a deputy chairman of the committee and the chairman of the commis Commission on, of the State Duma on studying the situation regarding human rights in foreign countries. She's a representative of the Just Russia faction and also represents the opposition in our delegation. Mr. Alexander Kozlowski is the deputy chairman of the Committee on International Affairs, a person who in our parliament is responsible for the parliamentary dimension of uh, the activities on security and cooperation in Europe where Russian and American delegations have been successfully cooperating and where I, in the former format of the Russian parliament, had the honor to make my acquaintance with uh, Steny Hoyer, the head of the delegation at that time, who is now the leader of the Democratic majority in Congress. Vasily Kuznetsov, also Deputy Chairman of the Committee, as well as Mr. Kozlowski, he represents the Unified Russia Fraction Majority and uh, heads the Subcommittee on Economic Cooperation. And finally, last but not least, Alexei Likhachev. He is not a member of our committee. He is the Deputy Chairman of the uh, Committee on Economic Policy and Entrepreneurship and Tourism in the State Duma and uh, deals with issues of Russia's entries, entry into the WT organiz organization because it deals with so many issues of uh, uh, legislative activities. We invited him to join our delegation today understanding that the issues of economic cooperation and uh, entry of the, of the Russian Federation to, to WTO, uh, repeal of the Jackson Atlantic Amendment, economic dialogue, are probably the most important issues standing before our countries in our dialogue. And for that reason, the parliamentary diplomacy can uh, uh, be the most effective weapon, uh, means to, to resolve that issue. Thank you for uh, your welcome, and I would like to return the microphone to you, Mr. Relentless.